preaching and more teaching. And a lot of tonight is going to be some uh, gathered thoughts uh, and encouragement about how we should uh, approach um, approach the creation uh, evolution discussion. So I want to talk about that uh, a little bit this evening. Um, it might not be my most well-organized uh, lesson I've ever put together, um, but I think that there is some information in here if you're looking for it that you'll be able to find very useful, practical, and that you're going to be able to use um, when you're, you're having Bible studies and you're looking at the creation evolution topic with some people. Um, so I want to start with 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll start in verse 1. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Be ready in season and out of season. There is... Um, the exhortation here in Scripture for us to be ready when opportunities and questions come up. You don't know when those opportunities are going to come. A lot of times, you know, they don't present yourself. They don't present themselves. You know, you don't wake up one morning and God sends you a text message saying, "I'm gonna, you know, send an opportunity your way today." That's not the way that works for any of us, right? I mean, the opportunities are there. A lot of times they're there even more than what we realize if we're willing to look for them. Um, I, when, when I'm aware and when I'm looking for it, those opportunities come up a whole lot more often than when I'm just kind of floating, right? Well, it's not that the opportunities aren't there. Otherwise, it has to do with my mindset, right? The scripture is be ready in season and out of season. What, what opportunities are there for us to be able to take advantage of. So that's what I wanted to talk about in as we approach uh, the idea of creation. So one of the things that spurred this topic uh, for me this evening is I was going through this with a, with a couple here recently and was presenting some material that, uh, you know, I had presented quite a bit before, but they were new to the information. So I went back and kind of look some of it up. And to my dismay, um, some of the information that even that I was citing, okay, it wasn't great information. It wasn't the best information um, that I could have been using to bring home the point, especially about creation, uh, that I wanted to bring out. Um, some, so specifically, the one that I was looking at was... Um, the trilobites that were found, the trilobite fossils that they found in sandals. And so again, do your own research. I'm not saying that that's not, that you can't use that information, but that information has a high degree of controversy associated with it. Okay? High degree of controversy associated with it. And from what I've seen, I'm not really comfortable using that one anymore. <clears throat> now, there's a lot of people that I've presented that to Okay, and, and thankfully, you know, it is, God is the creator, right? But we are looking for truth seekers, okay? And so I should have been called out on that one before, honestly, okay? Um, and so now there are all sorts of, um, all sorts of evidence, and I'll get to that, that proves the same thing. Okay? But that specific trilobites in, fossilized trilobites in the sandal, there's a high degree of controversy associated with that that I was not aware of. Okay? It's important that we know those things. Now, one of the ones that I've shied away from because I've researched and known about the controversy associated with it is the, um, the sandal prints in the Paluxy Riverbed, okay? So we've got the Paluxy Riverbed, if you guys are familiar with this, it's in Glen Rose, Texas. <clears throat> Paluxy Riverbed 
and uh, what we have is a dinosaur, lots and lots of dinosaur prints, and intersecting you have uh, man or sandal footprints that you can see, and they actually at one point intersect. So within the same rock strata you have a human footprint and a dinosaur footprint within the same rock strata. Pretty compelling evidence. Again, a lot of controversy associated with it. To me, this one's quite a bit stronger than like the trilobite stuff. Um, but you got to know that the controversy is there because otherwise you're going to get blindsided with opposing information. That if you weren't even aware of it, you're in trouble. Okay. Now, reason why, again, I'm not saying you can't use that. Okay. But, and like I said, it has quite a bit more credence than like the, the trilobite example. But there's been, um, it's been vandalized, okay, since um, here within the past, I don't know, 20 or so years, it's, that site has been vandalized, okay. With some of the erosion that has taken place, it's hard to see if it really was within the same strata, okay. As a, pref uh, as a preface, I meant to say this beforehand. I hated science in high school. It was not, I, I hated it, okay? It was not my, like the only thing I hated more was math, right? Okay, so <laughs> I hated science in high school. So <clears throat> this is not, I'm not speaking, I'm not up here speaking tonight with any sort of mm, scientific expertise, okay? But as a disciple maker, you have to know what you're talking about. Okay, and that's important that we know, and it's especially important that I have to do a little bit of extra work because I'm not very interested or good at the sciences. That's not where my interest lies. So I'm not going to spend the time to be like the number one preeminent expert within the new creation movement on creationism. That's not going to be me, okay? But I do need to know how to make a convincing proof and evidence of God's creation and be able to answer basic questions that you're going to run into and people are going to have. That's on me, okay? Any, uh, that's on all of us, okay? Be able to answer, give basic questions to the stuff that's going to generally come up and to know our evidence and to know the stuff that we're citing. It's important, okay? And so... Um, with the Paluxy Riverbed, one of the things uh, along with that is, you know, like, for instance, I, I've chosen that I'm not using that as much, okay? I need to fix my PowerPoints. That's one of the things that I need to do. It's on my to-do list it's so that I can get that with information that I'm more comfortable with, with putting out there, right? Um, so I haven't, I haven't got that done yet, but I need to. Um, other people can use the Plexi Riverbed. It's, there's, our side of it is also very compelling, <laughs> okay? It, we, it's not to say that that's not good information. And there are people who have been there. So like Mr. Wilson, he took his entire family there, was able to examine it with his own eyes, pre-vandalism, that sort of thing. Guess what? His scientific mind is a whole lot better than my scientific mind, and he's comfortable using it. So great. That's good for him. Okay, and maybe you can go to Glen Rose, Texas and be able to figure out something and, hey, that, that works good. But you got to know your stuff, right? So um, there's controversy uh, associated uh, with that as well. Um, another common one that, that we use that doesn't look, like, um, doesn't look like is really good evidence to use is, um, Brent always has to tell me how to pronounce this. Uh, it's a, the dinosaur, the, the paleosaurus, the plesiosaurus, thanks you. So a lot of the picture, okay, we've all seen it, um, of this, this big old carcass that they're taking out of the ocean. And for a long time, creationists were saying that it was a, thank you. And uh, so they were saying that, but they did additional test and it looks like that from the bones okay initially 
and it is a great sea monster, okay? Um, but as they have tested this thing, it is much more likely that the thing's a shark <laughs> or some other great <clears throat> creature, whale, that sort of thing. So that's good for you to know, okay? Because you know what? Very recently I've said, you know what they found coming out of the ocean? I did. Okay. Now, <clears throat> again, I'm saying that not, I'm not glad that I said it, right? But probably you've said that stuff too. Okay. And so we're looking for truth seekers and we're looking to give good and accurate information that is going to help people come to good and accurate conclusions because the truth is on our side. Another thing, guys, um, the other side doesn't care about truth, okay? The other side is willing to spin their argument however they need to to try to convince you or to discredit creationism. One of the things as truth seekers that it's really important that we do is accurately and objectively present the evidence. It's not just about making a convincing case. Okay? Because if we're making a convincing case that is absent of truth, we're not teaching them to think logically the way that they need to think and really follow through on the truth of the gospel. Okay? So it's important that we provide objective information all the way through. I um, had a thought that went along with that and completely lost. Oh, I want to talk about Kent Hovind. Who in here has heard of Kent Hovind? Anybody? Okay. Ah, good. Alex has. Um, <clears throat> Kent Hovind, I actually had a Bible study one time that went on for a number of months thanks to Kent Hovind. Young lady <clears throat> came into a uh, car wash and was passing out Kent Hovind DVDs. And uh, she didn't say too much, but it was basically a Kent Hovind had a creation presentation, okay? And she had these DVDs, and she was passing them out to people. Well, um, one of my coworkers got a hold of that, okay? It was, some of you guys might remember him, Zach. He got a hold of that, okay? And he was like, they didn't tell me any of this in school. So <clears throat> it was, you know, he said, hey, yeah, that's... That's, that's true. They didn't tell you that in school. And there's another side to this argument. And it turned into something really, really good and really positive. So God can even, um, you know, that provided an opportunity for me because Zach was looking for something and he was hearing enough truth in that to make him continue to look and to discover. Guys, Kent Hovind, okay, doesn't have as high of a bar as what I'm comfortable with for good science. Okay, Kent Hovind ha is currently in jail, I believe. Um, he had a amusement park that he was running in Florida, okay, and had some tax evasion issues uh, that landed him in some major trouble with the IRS. Now I think that there's a pretty good chance that he got targeted. You know, I'm not going to be too down on the guy for tax evasion. You know, anyway, <laughs> I, I didn't mean that. Um, <laughs> hey, you know, the scripture does have something to say about keeping a good name with everybody and specifically tells us to pay our taxes, right? Um, but I'm not sure that he wasn't targeted. The IRS hasn't been known to uh, target specific individuals. But you got to know what that guy's history is, okay? And that guy is willing to use iffy science to bolster his case, okay? Again, we don't want to just bolster our case. We want to teach people to think, and we want to teach people to love the truth, okay? So it's important to know who guys like Kent Hovind are. Now, Kent Hovind also has, and I'm sure that other guys have talked about it, but he talks about the six different types of evolution. 
Okay, and, and there are six different types of evolution, and it's important that we familiarize ourselves with those types of evolution. And it's important, again, you don't have to be an expert, okay, but if you can at least have a conversation and know that evolution isn't just one big thing, okay, there is, there is a huge difference between organic evolution and microevolution, okay? Within creation of circles, what do we call microevolution? Anybody? Yeah, somebody back there said it. Adaptation, right? Microevolution is real. It's a thing. Okay? Happens all the time. We see it. Okay? So it's important. A lot of the times your contacts are not going to, especially, okay, I come across this with a lot of the fellowship kids, is they have a hard time really understanding because we see and understand and know that adaptation, a.k.a. microevolution, is real and takes place, right? We know that natural selection is real and takes place, right? Therefore, the whole ball of wax must be true. See, they took a leap, right? Microevolution or adaptation does not make macroevolution true. Okay, but you got to know what those terms mean and be able to navigate a conversation where we're using those terms and be able to clearly state the difference between adaptation and natural selection and macroevolution, the changing of one form or species to another, right? And then I'll also know that there's <clears throat> cosmological evolution, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's important to know uh, our terms, and even if we're not experts, to be able to work our way to at least answer some basic questions. And then the other thing that I want to encourage us is to really know where to get the information if we have to take a deeper dive. Okay, because <clears throat> if I have to take a deeper dive, okay, I'm going to have to go to a lot of different places, okay, and I'm going to have to take the deeper dive. Right, because I'm not going to know offhand if you're going to ask me a specific question, probably about the uh, the geological uh, record. Okay, you know, I know that the pre-Cambrian -Cam period came before the Cambrian period, but that's about it, you know. And I just did that from English. I didn't do that from science. Okay, so <clears throat> again, if you've never heard of the Cambrian period, that's okay. Okay, but we need to be able to know where to go to be able to get the information that we need. And we got to be able to sort through what's good information and what's bad information. So some places for you to look at. Um, as, a good, as a good overview, um, I'm going to give you some resources now if you want to write them down or to check them out or make some notes on your phone or whatever. Um, Jared Schaefer has a really good scientific creationism. He doesn't, he doesn't go into a super deep dive on every idea, okay? But it is, to, to somebody who is not a science geek, right? It's deeper than what I need sometimes, right? So it's good because it pushes me and I need pushed. Okay, so it's really good because he, he starts talking about stuff like blue light and I'm like having to figure out what in the world that even is and doing that sort of thing, okay, is important. So if that's at newcreation.us, newcreation.us and then it's under apologetics and then scientific creationism, there's a tab there. Now, you can download the PDF, and he also has PowerPoints. Now, it was really nice because hey, David is a guy okay, who is more scientifically minded. So as an atheist, one of the things that we did is we just went over his PowerPoint, his stuff. You know, we got about a third of the way through, and he's like, okay, we can be done with this. I'm convinced. <laughs> you know, so, so after, you know, six, eight, ten weeks, we, we got, well, it's because it's good stuff. It's good material, okay? And he does have a high level of, okay, is this good science? I'm not just going to use it. Um, I got some more resources, so keep your pens handy. But 
that reminded me of other things that you want to be aware of. Okay, I have used, I don't know if I'm going to in the future or not, but <clears throat> you guys have, some of us have heard about the, um, the, fi the dinosaur figurines that they discovered um, at Acombro, uh, Mexico. Again, you need to know that there's a high level of controversy that's associated with those two as fakes or not. Um, so the reason why is because of potential uh, tourism, basically the idea to be able to uh, sell these sell these figurines, sell the area, right? That's one of the things, the Paluxy Riverbed thing, is that there were fakes, okay? And they sold those fakes to people, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that the one in the Paluxy Riverbed is a fake. It doesn't mean that. You'd have to make a leap. But there have been fakes before that they have gotten out and then sold to people, okay? And you have to know that that has happened. Um, the stuff at Acombro, again, it, there's a lot of really good evidence, right, for those being legit. And basically, if you're not familiar with what happened at Acombro, Mexico, all these figurines were discovered of all of these dinosaurs that were ceramic, that were made uh, between, you know, 250, 500, 80, 680, before we even would have known that there were dinosaurs according to evolutionary timeline. Again, because according to evolution, until we've been able to dig up these bones and be able to recreate, no humans would have known what dinosaurs could have looked like. And so that's a real problem if we have these people who, well, how did they know? These people in 500 AD, how in the world did they know to be able to create these, I mean, and there's thousands of these ceramic, clay, different types of dinosaur and dinosaur figures, dinosaurs uh, interacting with man, how would they know? Well, they wouldn't, okay, unless they saw them, right? Well, uh, again, it's, it's pretty compelling. But you also have to know that there have been charges of uh, them being fraudulent. I've actually had the opportunity to meet one of those guys who's inspected um, he's a, an archaeologist who has inspected those uh, figurines at a Combro. I can't remember his name. Do you? I was here yeah, I can't remember his name um, right now. Uh, but he was at a New York family camp, um, and me and Mr. Harbor uh, got to meet him at a New York family camp that kind of um, Sherry Dingman was putting on at the time. Um, so, again, knowing what is out there, if you look at, so newcreation.us, uh, under the apologetics tab, that's a really uh, good one to use. One that I use quite a bit is uh, Answers in Genesis, okay? Uh, again, for their creation stuff, is pretty good. Now, again, Ken Ham really, really, really kicked his debate with Bill Nye, okay? And one of the things that they do... Um, <clears throat> They don't do a very good job, really because of their Bible interpretation. They don't do a very good job of dealing with any sort of doctrinal or scriptural matters, and they hate the word proof, okay? Hate the word proof. Uh, again, one of the reasons why is because they are going to want to avoid any sort of references in the Old Testament predicting and prophesying the kingdom of heaven, Okay, as being the church, they want to avoid that. So it actually it creates a problem within their whole doctrinal theology that they have to stay away from proof. Okay, because they will just say evidence. Okay, they will just say evidence. And it, but they do have some good scientific material. Okay, and so when you look at and use some of the evidence that Answers in Genesis has, they can be really, really good and really useful uh, material. They also have a pretty high level of scientific uh, standards. Um, one, of the, one of the things early on, probably, I don't know, five, six or so years ago, maybe a little bit longer, I quit using the canopy theory. 
thanks to answers in Genesis. Okay? Again, am I, am I sure that God didn't use some sort of canopy? No. I'm not 100% sure. I'm sure that if he wanted to make a way for that, but I'm not sure in Genesis 1, that's what that's implying. Okay? And the science really doesn't work. Okay? From, from a perspective of basically what would that would create is almost a boiling type atmosphere here on the earth. Now, it doesn't create any problems for us big picture. It's fine. There's no problem. Um, but again, if you just... Uh, are throwing that out without understanding um, what the canopy theory is, and you've just been using it for the past 20 years because that's what I grew up with, you know, and that's okay. But we, we have to make sure that we continue to stay with the current and updated science so that people who are truth seekers aren't just going to roll their eyes, right? Okay, so um, answers in Genesis. Apologeticspress.com. Is another really good one. Um, they are a, as you can tell, they specialize in apologetics. Um, they're a uh, Church of Christ, specifically non-instrumental uh, group that does a lot of apologetics type work. Okay, so apologeticspress.com. They have a lot of good uh, creation, um, excuse me, creation evolution stuff, uh, and they do a. a a pretty good job. Um, Walt Brown uh, does uh, a lot of really, really good work. Again, his work uh, you can read and understand, but it can also get very technical. So if you have a question, okay, a specific question, well, maybe your contact understands and knows more about science than you do, read the Walt Brown stuff. Okay. You read the Walt Brown stuff, okay, he'll be able to uh, explain uh, the specific uh, questions that you have. One of the really amazing things that Walt Brown does is Walt Brown provides his contact information in the back of his textbook. He's on edition number eight or nine, eight. Okay. He has a literal textbook okay, that explains okay, why creation is true. He has a... He has a um, he has a standing offer to any and all evolutionists that he will debate at it basically at any time, any one, okay? They won't take him up on it. You'll notice that, okay, a lot of your leading evolutionists, a lot of your leading atheists, they will not debate creationists. They refuse to. Okay, and the reason why they refuse to, okay, is what, what they say is they don't want to lend credibility to it. Okay, well, that doesn't make... A lot of sense that you don't want to debate it because you don't want to lend credibility to it because it shouldn't if it's so discredited okay the debate should be no problem right um, but again they they refuse to uh, engage in any of that so for us it's important that we okay so let me finish up that part of it before I get to the next a uh, couple of other things privileged planet is a really good one Again, know your, know your resources, okay? Um, also, with the Walt Brown book, uh, we have a copy of it here at the building. Uh, you'll have to see Brenna and, like, you know, put your house mortgage up for it because she really values it. Uh, but, no, seriously, if you ever get a contact, you want to see that, we have one here. Um, Privileged Planet. Privileged Planet's really great. Uh, it can be dry, okay? I showed it one time at a life skills group, and I think half the kids tried to fall asleep. Um, <clears throat> but Privileged Planet's a really neat DVD that talks about all of the different ne uh, necessary um, functions for, uh, for a planet to be habitable and how we don't see any of those things in any other planet. We'll see, like, maybe one of them, maybe two of them. And there's all of these things that that Earth has so that it can be uh, habitable that none of these other planets have. Well, you've got to ask yourself just a question, is that really chance? All these other planets have two conditions, and it takes like 26 or 27 conditions, and we have them all, and all of the other planets in the universe have like two. Just, just chance? 
talks about the Goldilocks zone, that we're in a perfect position between our sun and our moon. Okay, again, again, know what you're looking at. Privileged planet, those guys are not creationists. Okay, and that's important to know. They're intelligent design people. Okay, it's important that you know the difference. Okay, I really like using Ben as a as a um, introduction. I like using Ben Stein's Expelled. Okay, they are not creationists. They're intelligent design people. I prepare my contact for. I will say I do not agree with some of the things that are brought out in this DVD. But I think that the question that is raised is really important. I think the question that is raised about why aren't you allowed to explore this topic is really important. I think the questions that are raised from some of the philosophical and moral questions that have to result from an evolutionary worldview that Expelled brings out, really important to ask. Okay, So no, don't just, hey, this is a creation material, I can show it, right? <clears throat> know what it is uh, that you're getting into and that you're, that you're showing. Um, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have time to get into, I'm not going to have time to get into some of our good evidences, but we do want to be able, okay, guys, it's really important. Mutations, Okay, are the linchpin upon which supposed upward evolution happens. Okay, and mutations are own, are very, 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 very often negative for the organism that has the mutation. Is rare is sometimes neutral for that organism, and is extremely, extremely rarely good. Okay. And they even have done experiments on bacteria looking for good uh, mutations where they can have generations upon generations uh, reproduce within a month period of time. And they, they cannot find a substantial number of good mutations. So they hardly ever happen. You have generations upon generations upon generations of bacteria reproduce within a period of, you know, a day and then two days and then five days and then we have all these generations of bacteria and yet we don't find good mutation. Well, that's the entire, we should, if evolution were true, we should be seeing good mutation everywhere all of the time. You have to. It's the very thing that makes the evolutionary model go. But we don't see it. And so being able to talk in those terms, and again, a lot of times, just your normal everyday Joe off the street, you have to explain what a genetic mutation is. Okay? Because that's not something that they really focus on or want to point out in the traditional education system. Right? They, don't, they don't want to point that out. They don't want you going in that direction. They just want you to talk about, they want to put all sorts of propaganda out there about homology, right? And again, homology is their their best uh, argument, and if you get into it, it's not that good. Okay? And homo homology is basically just when you hear uh, pseudo statistics like we're <clears throat> genetically 98% just like apes, right, or chimpanzees, or or whatever. Okay. Now, again, don't <laughs> make sure you know what you're disputing. Okay, because the the genetic information is there. But what does it show? Does it show, um, it, basically what it shows is that we had the same designer. Okay? And again, you can look at the huge differences um, between, uh, but the huge differences in, in that percentage between man and chimps and the idea of self-awareness, kind of a big deal, right? <laughs> having a spirit, kind of a big deal, okay? But you're going to lose an argument that says, oh, well, no, we're really not 90-whatever percent like the chimpanzees. You're going to lose that argument, but it's a bad argument anyway, okay? So, but they don't want to talk about mutations um, because the mutations, see, like I said, it's the entire linchpin, and it doesn't work. It just does not work. They don't want to talk about big picture questions like, 
where did the initial matter for the Big Bang come from? You know, you just keep going back. They got nothing, right? And it's important that we know other information, like they're willing to say really crazy things on the face of it. Like, I um, can't remember his name in particular, uh, but one of the leading scientists who actually was uh, in, in one of the most major court cases deciding creation, evolution in schools, okay, he says that or inorganic material became organic material because of mutations on the backs of crystals. Okay, so somehow there was some sort of stimulus on a crystal that all of a sudden you had a crystal go from being a crystal to being alive. And he's saying it with a straight face and pretending like the interviewer is stupid for not getting it. Again, inorganic matter does not spontaneously become organic. This doesn't happen. You can add all of the time in the world, you can add all the stimulus in the world, and organic material doesn't become organic. Okay? Um, other things to just kind of know. Okay, and again, we we can talk, we should, as as Christians and creationists, we should talk about the law of causality. Every effect needs a cause. You can prove that the universe is not eternal. So if you can prove that the universe is not eternal, it must have had a beginning and it must have had an end. So what is the cause for its beginning? Okay, and it has to have a sufficient cause. We want to talk about that. We want to talk about teleonomy, the fact that the universe shows a purposeful design. Well, therefore, there must have been a purposeful designer. Okay, these things are really important. We want to talk of the, the law of biogenesis. I referred to that earlier, is that living things come from living things. Okay. Uh, we want to talk about those things. And we also need to know, like I said, about some of the crazy stuff that evolutionists with a straight face will say that we are nuts for believing in the Christian God, the, as they would say, the Judeo-Christian God. They would pretend like we're nuts. But did you guys know that Richard Dawkins has not ruled out the possibility that we have been seated here by aliens. So he's sure that there's not the Judeo-Christian God. But he's not sure that E.T. didn't seat us here. So don't let them make you feel stupid. Okay? Uh, because, I think it's first, it's either first or second Peter, basically makes the point that false doctrine exists because people want to pursue their lust. Okay? The whole, the whole idea of trying to, to pit science against God and see, instead of seeing how God has purposefully designed his creation is because there are those who just will not and cannot accept the fact that there is one who is in authority over them. And that's why we have humanism. Okay? And so, again, there are those who are, there are those who are just deceived, Right? They're not necessarily coming at this thing from a, from a big humanist agenda, but rather that's what they've been taught in school, or rather you know, they, they view themselves as an intellectual, and society and culture has told them, you therefore cannot accept creationism. Well, just the opposite is actually true. I actually ended up with more material. I thought I was going to be short tonight, actually. Um, I guess next time I get up here, I have more stuff. But I want to read you guys a few names. Okay, of people who believed in the Bible, okay, and, um, well, you'll be familiar with the names. Joseph Lister, okay? Now, Joseph Lister, if you're not familiar, he's the one who, who came up with the importance uh, and emphasized antiseptic surgery. Okay, now, uh, if you remember maybe about a month ago, okay, my lesson where I was talking about Garfield a little bit, no, that was, he discovered antisepsis about 15 years before. 
they didn't use it on Garfield. Anyway, um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> Lister was a Bible believer. Louis, Louis Pasteur, Bible believer. Isaac Newton, Bible believer. Johann Kepler, Bible believer. Michael Faraday, Bible believer. Lord Kelvin, Bible believer. Gregor Mendel, Bible believer. I'm just hitting the high notes here, guys. There's, you can see I didn't read all those names, mostly because they're foreign and I can't pronounce them. <coughs> Leonardo da Vinci, okay? Pascal, okay? All sorts of, uh, I already say Johann Kepler, okay? All sorts of different types of science, okay? All sorts of different discoveries from Bible believers. That's where the engine of science has come from, people who believe in the Bible. There's a quote, and I don't have it printed off here, but there's a quote from um, that basically says, assuming that there is no design within the human brain doesn't do you any good. <laughs> it doesn't help you to discover anything. Assuming design is what helps you to discover the you know, all the different neuroscience uh, breakthroughs that they've had, they really have those breakthroughs because they have to assume design. They have to assume that it makes sense. It, it only works if you assume design. Well, again, assuming design, by extension, there has to be a designer. Okay. We really do have the intellectual high ground. Uh, let's just be prepared. Again, I've, I've said a lot of haves and a lot of need tos and a lot of you betters tonight. I hope that doesn't come, that doesn't come across like uh, pointing my finger at all because I, I tried to share that this isn't my specialty either, right? And mistakes that have been made and the mistakes that you've made, that's fine. And don't let it scare you that you don't know everything. Put yourself out there but then also be willing to do the research, be willing to find out the answers because we want people who want the truth. Okay, so let's stand up.